Hi, everybody. So uh, we'll start the Arotes test bench uh, webinar today. It is about like develop, test, and validate your all ECU. So today we'll have actually two presenters, myself, Matthew Eno. We, I am the offering manager of the aerospace at Apple RT uh, technology. So basically I'm uh, managing like, the coordination of all tools uh, that Apple RT is doing, actually I'm doing also the marketing for the aerospace industry. So uh, I'm really here to listen to you like as a customers and actually like uh, make sure that Apple RT can uh, bring uh, our tools and our services up to speed to, uh, to your needs. And I will be also assisted by uh, Alexandre Leboeuf. So Alexandre Leboeuf, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mathieu. Hi, everyone. Good. So you're hearing me well, I presume? <laughs> yes, it's working. Excellent. So uh, again, thank you, Mathieu. So uh, yes, my role at Opal RT is uh, Customer Solution Division Manager. Uh, basically, it's uh, coordinating the customer support effort throughout the world. Uh, specific uh, custom uh, project management and uh, custom project engineering team also is part of, uh, of uh, the group that I manage. Basically, it's the one shop stop for customer experience, basically. So today, like we have as an agenda, like uh, we'll have a short introduction about the concept of actually developing and test your ACU, like uh, actually a test bench. And today, like really the goal is to pass all the key concepts that will bring up to your needs actually and build the ACU and actually all the questions that you should ask and actually all the development stage to actually achieve to a final uh, test bench. So we'll start with the initial requirement and concept of a test bench. And then after that, we'll understand actually what is required or not for testing the device under test, the UUT, we call it. And then uh, we go through a design phase of the test bench. So this this is where we ask actually the question, how do, do we do the test bench to actually achieve our goal? And the consideration that we need over the real-time hardware and software, so what tool that you have to select at the end to uh, make your uh, project a success. Then we'll do a recap on the operating mission on those topics, like how we can help you if needed. And uh, we have a question period about your project. So like, don't hesitate at the end of the webinar to ask us questions. Yep. So if, as an introduction, like the, um, the the goal of this presentation is actually actually to uh, let you ask yourself question for your test ECU. So basically, we have a lots of experience uh, at Apple RT. Uh, I've been working actually with uh, Alex for uh, in this team for many years in one of the team for the services of the customers, uh, and now like uh, I'm the offering manager, so like I'm really want to bring my experience to the company. So on this webinar, what our goal is really to share our experience of a uh, lot of benches that we did, and actually a lot of customer that we work on, uh, and some like you know like quick facts and like question like question and like situation that we saw before. Um, because the, the real first goal of doing a test bench to test your ECU is finding error and search uh, during the uh, test and the certificate phases of a test bench as, as close as the lab and the production lab possible to make sure that as early as we find some uh, error or like we can uh, fix them, the cost will reduce a lot uh, than actually like waiting uh, later on the process to test the ECU. So ba basically, like after like seeing a lot of causes, like the uh, the impact of a test bench is really like to accelerate accelerate the design phase between the R and D and actually going to the production and certification. So this is a mandatory phases to use a test bench to do certification on the, on an ECU and a UT in the aerospace industry. Uh, the goal is also to improve uh, quality for sure. Okay, so like uh, like. The the closer uh, the earlier we can find any issues in the unit under test, actually it would be the easier to fix or, or to improve the system. So like the uh, quality would be improved as well. 
uh, will have also expandability. So uh, we want also like test bench to be uh, easily upgrade and actually be able to uh, do some replica to actually like extend the testers on uh, different uh, front. So may, in aerospace, especially like when you have a program for a new ECU, usually we have more than one benches because one more than uh, there's not only a single team that will test the uh, the systems, and that will bring all, uh, to us like a lot of speed and agility in the in the test and the certification. So if we look at the TRL, like the technology readiness level, uh, really we saw the bench starting around TRL R6. So basically the R&D is do its job, like we do the research, we start having prototype. So we're getting closer to have like a, a workable prototype. Uh, fully assembled, not just the breadboard. So at TRLX6, we start using the uh, test benches with the DHL systems. Uh, at TRLX6, I would say like it's more in R&D benches. And more we go forward to TRL7 and 8, we came across with more like benches for certification and actually maintenance at the end of the day. So the story that we want to propose today in this presentation, like it's really like going through you a story about like how do you design a test bench. So the first step that you you ask is like to really define the your requirement. So like it's really for you to understand what is the uh, the bench life cycle that your bench will have when you will design it. Then after that, like really ask you like what is the test that you want to uh, to achieve with your uh, with your system as a test synopsis. Uh, and also we want to share information about the project cycle. So uh, all the projects that come in like uh, points together. So like uh, we see a lot of them with different customer, but like we can regroup like a, a larger story about the project cycle. And then we have the UT, UT definition as the IECD. So this is really the starting point for the design where the IECD like will define like how to, con to connect the uh, UUT. So when we have this information, we ask ourselves, okay, how do we really want to connect the UT to our test environment, like our test bench? So we'll ask our question about like fault injection, breakout modules. Uh, do we want to test a, a single ECU or we want like a flexibility in the test bench to actually have different program associated to it? Uh, and also like, how do you prioritize these signals? So basically, like asking ourselves a question is all signals will be uh, needed for the HL system to be tested. Then after that, when we understand how to connect the UT, we go to the test bench phases. So like, how do we design the test bench as the wiring? Do we require some condition, uh, some special conditioning? And actually, what is the ergonomy of the test bench that we're looking for? Then, including in a test bench, we, we can go to the real-time platform. So defining what is the real-time platform requirement, like what is the performance, what kind of IOs we need, and especially what kind of communication. Aerospace test bench are heavily based on communication uh, signals as well. Then we go to the model development. So when we have all the hardware done, we need to think also about the software, so the model development. So what kind of tool are you looking for a suite of software that will let you do the model design? How do you manage your models? And also how do you control the real-time platform that will control the bench itself? Then we need to think about also who gonna operate the bench. So when we design the model, the job just started. Like now we're really getting into the uh, the jobs and we do the uh, certification or test on the UT. So what kind of tool are you looking for to do to be efficient in the visualization, the data recording and scripting for the operator to be efficient in his job? So we'll start with the first step. So the initial test requirement, and I will let uh, Alex Lebeuf to talk about his uh, initial test requirement. Yeah, thank you. So uh, as far as most test benches in Aero are concerned, the, the usual life cycle that we've seen throughout the years is that uh, a test bench in Aero has the longest lifespan of almost all test benches that we've seen in any market. Uh, this is most mostly related to the fact that uh, once an airplane is airborne, it usually uh, it, it is usually manufactured for a lot a lot of years. Uh, we're thinking about like uh, in the 20 years plus. So uh, usually the test bench needs to to follow the aircraft in that uh, lifespan. 
Um, obviously, not necessarily all test benches will last that long, but um, there are certain types of benches that you'll see that the, I want to present to you today. Uh, the first one is uh, is basically the, the the most involved system, the most precise, uh, that has the most uh, definition in, in, inserted in it. Most advanced equipment is uh, uh, also, and it's the full R and D or uh, rapid control prototyping benches. Uh, since the, they are the tools to make sure that the, what you've designed uh, is on par with the specs expected by the airframer for the the certification effort and the and, and, and their requirement as per se for the the aircraft. Obviously, you'll need to test everything more thoroughly to make sure that everything is in working order. Um, now, since those benches are usually the most uh, expensive ones, it's not necessarily the benches that we want to send to our service providers that will test subsystems of the controllers that we're going to be designing. Um, so in this specific case, what we will have a tendency to do is to do scaled down versions. And those scaled down versions will focus primarily uh, not necessarily on the specs, but on the functionality themselves. So it's going to be the systems that will have the most simulated item in it, so as to drop down costs and to make it more easy to, to maintain later on. The certification bench is basically the next evolution of your R&D bench. Uh, once you're done on your level and you want to, and you, you're pretty much uh, validated all the specs, well, your your next step basically is to get the certification on your on your hardware and software. So you're going to be able to use the bench to to be able to do just that. And finally, uh, last but not the least, it's the maintenance and support role. Um, basically, we don't usually sell new benches for that role specifically, but it's more like a, a transition of your uh, R&D bench or the scaled down versions that will be used that are transferred to that. And, and the purpose of, of those benches is since at this stage, the aircraft is airborne and is flying, uh, it's primarily to find bypass in errors that the pilots uh, see while during operating the aircraft uh, because we uh, well maybe you 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 know not but uh, a lot of the aircraft right now that are flying aren't necessarily um, uh, foolproof as per as per se for errors but all the pilots know the effective bypass to prevent having to go through the certification process again and it is not life-threatening it's just a matter of bypassing some uh, some of the subroutines so as to bypass a bug and uh, reset to a generic and uh, full operation mode and those benches at that main, uh, at that moment is specifically to be able to find those <clears throat> so imagine if you can change the the slide thank you so now that you've uh, focused a little bit on what bench you, you might want to, to have, like the purpose of the bench, you want to focus on what you're gonna be testing. So uh, it's really important to scope the list of tests that you will be mandatory for your bench, the plan bench, um, to be able to have a, a, a great success with it. Um, because some faults that you may want to validate may require subsystems that aren't part of your uh, your system in itself so you'll have to think a little bit outside the box to add some hardware for example or some software subroutine that will create uh, some events that your uh, controller obviously won't be able to do by himself uh, or the hardware that you're going to put in the bench that is related to the aircraft might not also be involved uh, since Usually you don't break uh, a torque motor, for example, to for a purpose of a test, you're gonna simulate it. So to be able to do that, you need to really think about the faults that you want to, uh, to do. So um, the list of tests also will probably uh, define a little bit the environment of the design that you'll be using and where your test bench will be, uh, will be set up. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, now a project cycle okay uh, in aero we we'll, we are all pretty much acquainted with project management it's part of our daily life um 
for test benches, we don't do anything different, to be honest. Um, so the, the, the key words here is plan ahead. Why? A lot of equipment require long lead times to be able to, uh, to arrive. And uh, we want them to be able to, um, to, to take into account that into your timeline. So that way you don't uh, get sidetracked by delays. There are some equipment also like GNSS uh, for the GPS control and simulation of the, uh, of the star, uh, the star um, maps uh, that may be used by your system that requires some sort of uh, government approvals. So uh, this also, uh, we all know that governments uh, aren't necessarily focusing on industry requirements. So sometimes it may take more longer than uh, we would like. So it's always good to plan ahead and integrate this inside, uh, inside our, our program. Uh, here what I'm, I'm showing is basically um, a step-down version of a, um, an aero um, project management uh, milestones like uh, the preliminary design review PDR, CDR, which is the critical design reviews, are things that you should be uh, eligible about in the aero, uh, aerospace mode, project management. But what we've done is that we've uh, we've stepped it down a little bit uh, in the criticity and uh, the different uh, documents to be provided at each milestone to be able to be more flexible. Because let's say, for example, you're doing a design for an R&D bench. Well, usually your controller is not finally designed yet. So your specs might be evolving as the bench is being built, as the design is being done. So you need to be able to account for that in your project management to be able to uh, prevent costly changes later in the program. Also, it's not written here but uh, in, in the timeline, but you definitely need to have an ITP, integrated test plan, added at the, uh, at the reception of the bench in your premises. Why is that? Is because as good as we are, uh, as our intentions are, we we go and evaluate everything to the smallest details. There will be always something that will differ from the reality. So uh, it's not uncommon that the specs that were given are not necessarily matching the design of the ECU that was done. And we need to make some adjustments before going to the actual test phases. So you need to plan for an integrated test plan before starting your tests. Next slide. So uh, on to the EICD. So uh, the EICD stands for Electrical Interface Control Document. Uh, usually it's an Excel document that will list all the ECU's uh, IOs. Airframer usually use those for all the subsystems that will be present in the aircraft. So as to be able to monitor everything uh, on a versioning level. Why the versioning level is to make sure that everybody's working on the latest version and not have uh, the engine uh, provider working on version 1.2, uh, the air management system working on version uh, 2.8, and in the end, they don't match up. So that's why the electrical interface control document is so critical to the bench design is because it follows the airframer and your customers and your providers uh, on a single point of the design of the controller. Usually what we're gonna want also to be uh, showing in this document is uh, not only the, the mnemonics, so basically the names of their signal, but also their signal types. For example, uh, you have like RTDs for uh, sensor temperature. Uh, let's say with the Excel, it's gonna be super easy to see that you have like 26. Uh, and that in ver the next version, you have like 28. So it's important to, to be able to have those details. So that way it, it puts um, everybody at ease and in the know about what changed and what's the uh, the next evolution into the uh, the, the um, evolution of your ECU basically. So uh, I would like yeah. to point it out that uh, during all my experience in the integration is like the sooner we get this document, the faster we can get an, uh, across all the process of creating a bench. Because like if we don't have this at first, uh, 
early in the stage, we will like just take the time to build this kind of document to make sure that we all talk the same uh, about the same thing. So we will like a service provider as a polarity can work with you to build it. But if we start with a document that already exists, that save us a lot of time and actually a lot of confusion. So it's really a key document that we uh, that we base all our design on it. Yeah, that's true, Mathieu. Uh, and if for, for any number of reasons, you don't have such a document uh, in your templates, uh, don't worry. Most integrators uh, should be able to provide you with a template of their own to be able to start with. And that can be done as early as the quoting phase. So you can ask your sales representative of the different integrators that you're uh, in communication with to be able to provide you with such a template. Um, it's going to show you also a little bit on the... Um, the seriousness of the, the integrator and how involved they are in the aerospace industry, because it is the starting point of the design of the bench, literally, like Matthew mentioned. So the next step in our uh, uh, like presentation is the utility connectivity. So now we add the initial test requirement. So we saw what we need. Now, like we can start thinking about like what a, a test bench will look, and we start with the connection with the UT with Alex. Yes, what we can see here uh, to highlight the connectivity that is present in the bench is uh, on the left, a typical configuration of some of the boxes that will interact together. Uh, the control unit or ECU is at the bottom of, the, of this uh, typical configuration. And you have an example on the right of a test bench that was, uh, that was done uh, by Opal RT. But uh, most test benches are pretty, uh, pretty look alike. So it's a good representation of what you will be able to see uh, whoever manufactures the bench. So um, rapidly what we will have in there, and I'll go a little bit more in details of uh, each of, of the different items, but you'll have the, the controller obviously, but you also have the simulator in itself, uh, conditioning units because uh, the IOs aren't necessarily always um, a direct connection, different loads, um, and the fault insertion unit and breakout box, which brings me to the next slide. So basically, uh, before getting in the, uh, the FIU and uh, the fault insertion units, uh, one part that we want to focus also is to know how your controller will be uh, interconnected with the bench. Why I'm saying this is because sometimes you have a multiple program approach and the bench will be using different controllers. Uh, maybe you have a high hardware upgrade rate. So uh, you'll be swapping the controller really often. So you need to take that into account how you design it. Uh, perhaps you'll have a multi-unit under test configuration like the picture on the left. Uh, what you see there is a configuration for three controllers. So uh, on a, what we call a Narank chair. So basically the top part is completely removable with zero insertion force connectors. So that way you can just design a specific chair for the controller configuration you have and connect it to the bench while having the a generic interface. So um, the generic interfaces brings us to the, the, the newest trend in Aero, which is the generic test benches. Okay, um, we've seen in the previous slide the test bench that was uh, comprised of only one cabinet. But the trend now is to be able to design two cabinets. Uh, the first one that will have the core of the simulation and a generic number of different type of IOs or subsystems. So let's say uh, 18 leak detection loops, uh, PT500, uh, let's say I have 50 and the like, so as to fit most of your configuration that you'll be uh, having for uh, presently in the future. And you have the second cabinet that will be the specifics. So the loads pertaining to your system, so uh, torque motors and stuff like that, uh, or the ECUs themselves with such uh, iron chair to interconnect the controllers. So uh, if I can add also to, for the generic test benches, the main idea that we see a trend like uh, for the last few years is like we saw the uh, cycle of the test bench. So when all the certification is done, like the bench go to like uh, 
static configuration where it's there for maintenance. So if something happened or they need to do, uh, recheck something, they will like actually reconnect the bench and like uh, restart using it. But this bench can actually cannot be used for like many years. So what they want as during test benches is a flexible part where all signals are generated as a generic thing. And this part actually could be moved from program to the other program. So like the, they will have like special configuration for one ECU or one UUT, like a program, but like the main real-time part and like the conditioning could be something that be reused on different parts. So uh, so basically like they will, they see that there's a lot of cost of money to actually like not hold like a part of the bench stick to like a, a whole program and take the generic part of the pro, uh, the benches to be moved around different uh, dif between different programs. So this is the idea of generic test benches. Yeah, and, and to add uh, also a little bit on that is usually the uh, in the maintenance phase, the benches aren't used 24 hours, seven days a week. So it gives us the opportunity to probably leverage that uh, that purchase or that design to be used somewhere else when we have the generic test bench approach. So uh, now we're talking about the uh, FIU. Uh, Mathieu, again, yeah. So uh, the FRU or fault insertion unit uh, basically is one of the most interesting feature that uh, you can add to your test bench. Uh, why? Because it's automatable for your electrical tests. So this gives you the opportunity to program via scripts um, a wide range of different tests that you might want to do. Uh, on the electrical front. For example, you can want to have a, a, a simulation of a, an open an open signal, an open wire, so as a loss of your sensor, for example, and see how the controller reacts. Uh, also to short two, two uh, signals together, again, to see how the controller reacts and, and so on. This uh, usually is to validate all the cases that hopefully will never happen in the aircraft, but sadly may happen once in a while. And we want to ensure obviously that the controller won't go haywire and do uh, and, and and drop in safe mode and uh, it stops the engine, for example. So uh, that's part of the game to, to, to be able to test. And also the fact that it's automatable uh, permits you to save your test engineers to be able to do the analysis of the results that will be give uh, that will be generated throughout the night for instance or throughout the weekend so that way you can um, have a focus on, on your uh, on your engineers as to really do analysis where their time is most well spent than to actually manually connect wires to generate the errors to see what's going on so that's why the FIU usually is the most interesting part to have in your bench. The, the, on a side note, though, is usually one of the most expensive item uh, per line. So what you'll want to do at this stage is usually to do a selection of what signal has the most value to go through it. So, uh, for example, uh, we use, let's say, on, on the left, we have a Pickering uh, FIU card for uh, high current signals. Well, if we want to do some tests on the power lines of the controller, uh, it might be super critical components. So that makes sense to have it in the bench, but uh, certain uh, temperature sensors aren't that critical to be validated. And if we lose them somewhat, the controller will still be able to manage with encoded values uh, default values and will still be able to 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 work so this one might be able to be done manually so you it, it's not necessarily critical to have it in the automatable uh, box so on, on this front you can save on the cost of the of the fiu for for that purpose the next step uh, is the uh, manual breakout box, which is basically a little bit like the uh, fault insertion unit in a sense that it permits to do the same test. So you can uh, manually short two wires together, uh, insert uh, different type of, uh, of noise signals. For example, you want to validate uh, the impact 
of uh, the injection of a 60 hertz wave on the monitoring of the alternator generated signal. So you can send a signal on this manually through the uh, breakout box. Um, so that's the counterpart that is cheaper to the fault insertion unit. But again, you have to have your engineer perform the test or your technicians to be able to perform the, the test manually on this front. And um, if I can give you an yeah. advice, like I will probably say that it's almost a mandatory to have like a breakout box like that, or actually a certain way to access some signals um, during commissioning with customers. Like that saved me a, a lot of trouble many, many times. Imagine yourself, like you, a controller have many buses of communication. For some reason, one of them get damaged or doesn't work as a, as you expected, and you want to test that. A breakout unit like that make you an easy connection without like actually opening the test bench to actually like isolate the bus and actually maybe just with wires swap two buses internally in the bench. That's something that it could be really useful. Uh, you want actually just probe what's going on in the signals. You, you're sending like a signals like for like a, let's say temperatures and like the temperature is offset of 10 degrees in the uh, the reading of the controllers. What's going on? You want to demystify where is the, the problem. So is it the signal that they're not good? Like maybe the test band doesn't do the right signal. So you know what you're expecting. So with an oscilloscope or a multimeter or whatever tools, like the breakout box lets you have a quick access to the signals and measure it. Same thing as adding like a quick filter, like you know, like you have noise on the signals for some reason that you didn't expect it. Uh, with a breakout box, you can mount like a, a small setup there, just as prototype to actually do a filter and maybe like that's what correct and uh, adjust the test bench for that. For sure, once you find a solution, you will probably incorporate the solution uh, as a fixed solution in the test bench. So basically you will open the test bench and have this component. But the breakout box give you like a, an open access to all those signals to actually like advance quickly and during the, the phases. So I cannot like strongly <laughs> advise to include like as some 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 of those uh, breakout modules in your systems during yeah. your design phase. Material, you're right in a sense that the breakout box uh, is one of the most powerful tool for debugging the bench and your system, as it gives you the opportunity to open up, if we can say so, the system and the signals without having to cut wires or to be able to have to open boxes or to actually uh, monitor on the ECU itself. So it's uh, like the FIU that is a super powerful tool for automation and save time. The breakout box is a, a tremendous tool for uh, debugging your bench. So much so that uh, some of our customers have been designing uh, mobile breakout boxes. So that they're not like the example shown here, uh, rack mountable, but are actually small suitcases that you can move about and interconnect in the different benches. Um, so that way you can save on cost while having one set of mobile breakout boxes, for instance, and, and after that reuse them on different, uh, on different uh, benches. The only, the only thing you need to keep in mind is that you need to have the same type of connectors to be able to connect to the different uh, test benches or do patch harnesses to be able to interface. Uh, depending on is your design approach and how you're uh, managing the, um, the benches that you have in the house. Okay, so it's something that uh, you, you don't want to live without. You, you could probably manage without an FIU, taking more time, but the breakout box is uh, one of the best tools to uh, for the engineer. It's the engineer's best friend in test benches. I agree to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, that's conclude the connectivity. So after that, when you set up like the way you want to manage the connection with the UT, is like we're going deeper as the test benches itself. So the test bench is the more static part of the uh, the setup. So where you have wiring, conditioning for some signals, and like actually really thinking about the bench ergonomics. 